We are recording our the meetings that we do on Zoom for the purposes of information and note taking. We're not putting these out for everybody to see, but just to have a record so that we can go back and um, uh, deal with any questions that we might have about what was said and what happened. Um, so welcome everybody. Our program today is going to be uh, about communities of opportunity and with Allison DeCourcy of United Community, Yolanda Thompson of United Community also, and Palace Washington, uh, Fairfax County Department of Neighborhood and Community Services. And before we, before we do that, uh, we usually start with the blessing. And it turns out the person that I had asked to do the blessing today um, is, um, is, was told me at the last minute he was unable to be here. If you will permit me, I don't normally like to do this when I'm the chair. If you will permit me, I'm just going to jump in with um, a blessing from the Baha'i tradition. And I want to share a little bit about what it is. Um, there, there's a particular short prayer. It's called the remover of difficulties, which I think we and our country and our world need at the moment. It's a short prayer, which I will recite first in Arabic and then I will say in English. And then another short passage from uh, the Baha'i uh, Baha prayers as well. Let us pray. هل من مفرج غير الله قل سبحان الله هو الله كل عباد الله وكل بأمره قائم Is there any remover of difficulties save God Say praised be God He is God all are his servants and all abide by his bidding. Make us ready, O Lord, in all circumstances to serve thee and to set ourselves towards the adored sanctuary of thy revelation and of thy beauty. If it be thy pleasure, make us to grow as tender herbs in the meadows of thy grace that the gentle winds of thy will may stir us up and bend us into conformity with thy pleasure in such wise that our movement and our stillness may be wholly directed by thee. O oh God, lift the hearts of all who are here, that whatever may be weighing upon their souls and their hearts today, may be lifted and may be substituted by joy and by hope and by the assurance that thou art here at our side and thou art also the Lord of the universe in charge of all that is. In thy name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so today we have Allison DeCourcy. Oh, before I do that, we, we should have introductions. I shouldn't forget that, so I don't wanna leave it till last. Uh, if I'm gonna go around and ask everybody that I see here to do introductions, brief introductions. If you have a really important announcement that you, can't get to Christina for distribution or that you can't put in the chat, you're free to do it, but don't make it very long, okay? Preference is let's send to Christina, let her send it out or put something in the chat because we'll save the chat and we'll make sure that everybody uh, gets any announcement that's in. So can we start, can we start with, um, well, Paulus, you're at the top of and so I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself real quick. Sure. Palace Washington, Fairfax County Department of Neighborhood and Community Services. And I function as a regional manager for the agency supporting Mount Vernon and Lee District um, in the coordination of health and human services, 
our community development, as well as our um, center operations for all the teen, senior, and community centers in the region. Thank you. And I'll just introduce myself, Bill Collins. I'm with the Baha'i community in Mount Vernon and also co-facilitator of Ventures and Community. Karen Latta. I am Karen Latta. I'm a member at Aldersgate United Methodist Church and I am the big treasurer. Christina. Tina Schoendorf with United Community and Vic Correspondence. Keith. Keith Davey, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, as well as on the steering committee for Vic. Thanks. Allison, just quick. Good, good uh, morning still. I'm Allison DeCourcy. I'm the president and CEO of United Community. Thanks. David Levine. Good morning, uh, Dave Levine, uh, uh, President and CEO of Good Shepherd Housing and Family Services, and also a member of the VIC Steering Committee. Ann Hardgrove. Where'd she go? Hi, I'm Ann Hardgrove. I'm with St. Luke's Episcopal Church, and I'm a member of the VIC Steering Committee. Ron Fitzsimmons. Oh, unmute yourself. Hi, I'm uh, Ron Fitzsimmons and I'm the executive director of Alice's Kids. Victor. Uh, Vic Marshall from Groveton Baptist Church and also the Vic Recording Secretary. Great job. Lynn Thompson, Lynn. Hi, uh, Good Shepherd Catholic Church, and I also coordinate volunteers to bring food and serve at the Rock Soup Kitchen. And we are still open on Mondays and Wednesdays for uh, go boxes. Thank you. Lea Tenorio. I like how you pronounce my name, Bill. Um, Lea Tenorio, director, <laughs> director of Hispanic Ministry and Social Justice at Good Shepherd Catholic Church. Bob Malone. Good morning. My name is Bob Malone and I'm the pastor at Mount Vernon Presbyterian Church here in Alexandria. Kevin. Kevin Kreitz. Uh, uh, Kevin Kreitz of uh, ICNA, Islamic Circle of North America, the local mosque just off of Route 1 in Iba Valley. I hope my Arabic was okay. Very good. Very good. Mary Payton. Uh, I'm Mary Payton. I'm uh, on the VIC steering committee, also the chair of the South County Task Force and the housing committee chair at Fairfax NAACP. Uh, Robert, Robert Miller. Bob Miller from uh, Shepherd Center, South County, uh, Fairfax Burke, uh, uh, and I'm the transportation manager there. Good. Mr. McDonald. I see a Z McDonald there. <laughs> Hi, my name is Zach McDonald. I'm the new um, staff attorney at the Route 1 office um, from Legal Services in Northern Virginia. Senora Cantoni. Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Maria Jose Cantoni. I am the director of the Financial Empowerment Center at South County Government Center. Happy to be here. Julia. Good morning, everybody. My name is Julia Kravitz. I am Congressman Byers Outreach Coordinator. And if I may just plug that we are having a telephone town hall next Monday, Martin Luther King Day. Um, I will send Christina the information once I have it. Have Good. a great day, everyone. Thank you. Katina. Oops, <laughs> things switched around. I suddenly have Joe Fay there in place of Katina. Okay, Joe, introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Joe Fay. I'm the executive director at FACETS um, and uh, co-chair with Bill of uh, the VIC Steering Committee. Okay, Jan, Jan Buchanan. Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Jan Buchanan, and I'm the executive director of Mount Vernon at Home, um, a village in South County serving seniors. Um, nice to be here. Thank you. I'm, we're a member of VIC was on the VIC steering committee, but I'm a newbie, so I'm I'm gonna be a sponge this year. Nice to see everyone. Good. 
Pam. Pam Michelle, Executive Director at New Hope Housing and also a member of the steering committee. Jean Brown. Good, good morning, it's so good to see everyone. Shepherd Center, South County, I work with Bob Miller. I'm the volunteer recruiter. Thank you, Nicole. Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Wright. I'm with United Community and my role is Collective Impact Strategy Manager. Okay, Lloyd. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lloyd Tucker with Neighborhood and Community Services, and I am the uh, Division Director of Regional Services and Center Operations. Thank you. Um, let's see. Now I've got the Katina. I think switched around on me there. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I had my, my hand on the button all ready to go. <laughs> um, good morning, Katina Matthews with uh, Fairfax County Neighborhood and Community Services. I am the Community Developer for, for Region 1 and also a member of the VIC Steering Committee. Thank you. Yolanda. Hello, everyone. My name is Yolanda Earl Thompson, and I am the Director of Collective Impact uh, working at United Community. Thank you. I have, um, I hope I've gotten everybody here. Arlene. Hi, my name is Arlene Borschwitz. I'm Executive Director of NVMS Conflict Resolution Center. Thank you. Tracy. Tracy Huntley. Good morning, everyone. I am Tracy Huntley. I am the Director of Operations at Artemis House Domestic Violence Shelter in South County. Mm, thank you. Diego Rodriguez. Good morning, everybody. My name is Diego Rodriguez Cabrera, and I am the Community and Latinx Outreach Coordinator for Supervisor Dan Stork. Thank you. Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary Clay, St. Mark's Episcopal. Thank you. And Donald Barnes, I think, is the last one. Donald? Okay, Donald Barnes, Groveton Baptist Church. Thank you. Did I miss anybody? Because th things were switching around on my screen. So, <laughs> I hope. all right. So, welcome. And don't forget, if you do have announcements that you want think you sent out, you know, get them to Christina, or you can put in the chat, and we can also make sure that we um, record those if there's like lots of detail. Um, so, I, I don't want to open a lot of things, but just ask, how are you all feeling? And I hope that in everything right now and that our country is dealing with that, um, that you will be comforted in being here to learn and to figure out what actions we can take to make the world a better place. So we have with us today, Allison Corsi and Yolanda Thompson, Earl Thompson and Paulus Washington to talk to us about uh, communities of opportunity, areas in the Fairfax County where the need for basic services are especially acute. And I am just going to turn it over to Allison right now. I've given her permission to share, so hopefully that will all work right and um, take it away. All right, Bill, thank you so much. I'm going to try sharing my screen here. Can you all see this? Yep. Okay, there we go. All right, so well, I'm Allison DeCourcy, again, President and CEO of United Community, uh, joined by Yolanda Earl Thompson, our Director of Collective Impact, and Palace Washington, uh, Regional Region 1 um, Head of NCS. Um, Thank you for this opportunity to share with you the important work that United Community has begun doing related to the one Fairfax social and racial equity policy that is meant to address structural racism that exists in the community that we serve. Um, here at United Community, with 52 years in the community, we've really developed a growing understanding of equity and its root causes. And we recognize that downstream programmatic solutions, offering food, offering housing, 
are, et cetera, are, are not sufficient to fully change the trajectory of life outcomes for those that are living in the community that we serve. We also know that place matters. We've developed a growing understanding of that in the last few years that, and research has demonstrated to us that where you live, your zip code has a dramatic impact on life success. In part of a research project that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, we know that residents who live on the west side of Route 1, and you see in front of you um, a picture, and you can see if my um, uh, cursor can follow along, you can see Route 1 here. Um, those of folks who live on the west side of Route 1 or what we term the wrong side of a wall in the presentation fare much worse than those on the, the east side. They, they struggle to buy food, to pay rent, to obtain an education, to stay safe, and otherwise meet their basic needs. They live on the largest island of disadvantage as described by the Northern Virginia Health Foundation. And, and during this conversation, we'll be sure to put in the, the chat um, a link to that really groundbreaking research that Northern Virginia Health Foundation did about these islands of disadvantage, you know, where these basic needs are being met around, you know, just absolute wealth. You know, Fairfax is the second or third wealthiest county in the nation. So our initiative, Communities of Opportunity, which we'll share to you, with you about, is absolutely aligned with One Fairfax. And we've worked closely and continue to do so with Carla Bruce, who's our Chief Equity Officer. I think you all know Carla, as well as Palace Washington. And so I'm going to hand over right now the presentation to, to Palace to describe countywide efforts around equity and how they see Communities of Opportunity. And then we'll, we'll take it back from her. So Palace, over to you. Thanks, Allison. And um, as we were putting this uh, slide deck together, it resonated for us um, the request of that Vic made to make sure that the conversation that we had um, really had a county uh, perspective so that you could see how the work that United Community is doing is aligned with the uh, bigger system efforts. And, Many of you have had the opportunity to really dive into One Fairfax, where you know that the county um, aim is to advance equity by totally unlocking the potential of every resident um, in every area of the county, recognizing, um, and Allison, next slide would be also helpful. I think the visual is very important. It's that um, it, it isn't a one size uh, fit all um, conversation. The county's commitment is to intentionally integrate equity policies, planning, practices into the, the five major strategic buckets of work, which are cradle to career success, community health um, and well being, community safety and justice, and inclusive prosperity. And in order to do this uh, as a core strategy to address racial and social inequities, the county has adopted communities of opportunity as a strategic framework to advance opportunity and um, achieve equity. Um, communities of opportunity is a systems focused uh, place and population based approach. And, and you're gonna hear a little bit um, from United Community about their place-based, population-based approach to this. But it's, it's the key piece is to address the spatial inequities that um, are, are the key constraints to opportunity and to ensure that equitable access to services, resources are addressed in what we're calling the um, uneven opportunity landscape um, or islands of disadvantage that, uh, that impedes certain communities from um, achieving um, economic mobility. So in the next slide, you'll see that there are uh, four uh, key priority principles or elements of communities of opportunity um, that when thinking about this strategic uh, a framework are important in the conversation uh, to transform islands of disadvantage into areas where um, 
res residents who are facing economic, education, health, housing, or other challenges have um, a, a, an opportunity for, um, for, for them to experience uh, uh, opportunity or better, uh, better landscape. So one of the main elements is understanding vulnerability and opportunity. And um, that's really about ensuring that there are uh, tools to better understand what are the opportunity, the dynamics of opportunity and vulnerability in the county. Targeted inventions to build opportunity is just facilitating the development of targeted strategic interventions in low opportunity areas to truly cultivate opportunity structures, um, whether it is the alignment or collective impact or the um, leveraging of resources is, is truly building um, that, that, that opportunity um, uh, setting. Uh, the other element is target interventions to connect to opportunity. It is, it is important to connect low income um, communities or other otherwise marginalized individuals and families to existing opportunities. So we definitely have to make sure that we're thinking about how, what are the networks um, that that can, uh, to ensure that that occurs and that those connections are intentional um, as we're providing services and support to vulnerable families. And then the last principle is just the idea that we need to encourage the development of an inclusive um, economy. It is critical in order for us to sustain our, our strong economy, we need to expand opportunities for and the advancement of, of shared prosperity for all residents um, in, 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 the, in the county. So closing the loop of traditional work, uh, workforce development by linking to trainings and, and, and actual livable uh, wage paying employment opportunities is like one example of what that will look like. So all four of these principles um, are working together, interconnected, and each one plays a critical role in building that communities of opportunity framework that supports um, the ultimate uh, economic mobility and, and, and creating a different landscape for families in, in Fairfax County. In the next slide, you'll be able to see that there are key elements of, of communities of opportunity. When you think of any of these uh, elements, whether it's education, employment, um, food, recreation, it is important that our policies or structures or system, including those in government, um, uh, have sustained an even contribution to the inequities pr present in our community. So we recognize that as government entities, we also play a role in, in how these inequities present in our community. So it is gonna be very crucial for us to um, have these, uh, results that lead towards uh, a better uh, opportunities for families. Um, but it, it's not only something that as county government we should be thinking about, but our nonprofit programs and structures are also part of um, how we need to make sure that we, we galvanize our community. So um, as a whole, it is important to just recognize that communities of opportunity is a framework is, is part of the, the support system to develop pro-equity systems, structures, policies, and programs for individuals to thrive regardless of their race and, and place. Um, so as you can see, it is a truly critical part of the equity conversation as well. So when you think about the uneven opportunity landscape um, in which we need to be uh, laser focused on, um, you know, you, we're, we're thinking about it not only from, uh, and the two maps on the next slide is, is depicting this, you're not only thinking about it from, you know, the Fairfax County lens of islands of disadvantage, which there are uh, definitely 
islands of disadvantage sprinkled throughout Fairfax County and in the Mount Vernon Lee District, we have ways to, through data, to be able to identify where those islands of disadvantage are. But it is, it is, it is part of what Allison is going to talk about is that as you look at these various islands of disadvantage, you're going to see and that data reveals that the landscape is not the same, opportunity is not the same, life expectancy is not the same. Um, and much of it is due to em environmental conditions that shape um, the health and the conditions of, of these neighborhoods. So it's gonna be important for collective um, communities of opportunity be that framework to bring to light the importance of how to really address these, these clusters of communities that, or islands of disadvantage that um, are within Fairfax County. And as a, as a county, one of the things that we're really looking at is how do we take the information that we're gonna be garnering from our conversation here in region one with United Community and the work that they're doing to also inform the larger system um, around how communities of opportunity um, can be rolled out in other sectors within Fairfax County that are also exhibiting um, some of the same um, environmental uh, challenges that are creating the uneven inequitable conditions that families and, and residents are facing. Okay, well, let me continue on with this slide and, and uh, just share a little bit of background information that gets us moving into the work. Uh, we, we've set the stage for why we're doing the work, um, but data will help cement that and then we'll be able to tell you about where the work is going. Um, as Pallas mentioned, on the left-hand side of, this, of the screen here, you see um, the islands of disadvantage that were uncovered um, in a report by the Northern Virginia Health Foundation. Uh, the largest island uh, in here, if you see my cursor, um, is, or my arrow, I should say, is, is where we are. You know, we're sitting someplace right around here. Um, it, it, it's, it's in region one, it's, it's massive. And Northern Virginia Health Foundation approached us and to make a long story short, we were given um, an opportunity to do research into this community. And actually we honed in on um, two census tracts within the community, which I'll share with you in just a moment. But the question may, you may be asking is why is a, a um, health foundation focused on on, on this? Well, it's because we know that, and you may be familiar with this graphic, that 50% of one's health is determined not by our genetic makeup, um, but rather our health behaviors, um, excuse me, uh, um, you know, where, where we live, you know, our social and economic opportunities, the resources and supports that are available to us and in our neighborhoods, the quality of our schooling, the safety of our workplaces, the cleanliness of our food and water. So as this graphic shows, 50% of one's health can be traced to a zip code. So we honed in on zip codes and actually census tracts and were able to look at these census tracts to see the significant multiple serious, serious challenges and struggles that our community members there face, again, interspersed among the region's wealthiest communities. <clears throat> the, the right, excuse me, the left-hand side of the slide shows, you know, kind of broader region one. That circle there is, is where we're honing in on. And here on the left, on the right, are we're showing three census tracts, but I'm going to show you um, or point to the two that we're most focused on. It's the one here in the center, 
4215. That is known as um, the Hybla Valley Census Tract. And the one to the south of it is known as the Jana Lee Census Tract. Those two census tracts, and you can see underneath here, what neighborhoods lie in those census tracts, Harmony Place through Murray Gate. Those are two out of the three uh, uh, most economically challenged census tracts in all of Fairfax County. So one in three, the second one is in Bailey's Crossroads. And so we chose to focus it on these two adjacent neighborhoods. They have low levels of, of education, high levels of economic distress, inadequate housing and transportation, a large number of uh, residents without health insurance. People of color experience disproportionate exposure to these adverse conditions. People of color are the vast, represent the vast makeup of these communities. I want to talk about, I want to just give you a comparison, really, of two of the um, two, two different census tracts. 4215, as I mentioned before, is Hybla Valley. The northern border is Lockheed. The southern border is, is uh, uh, Buckman. Um, and the eastern border, I'm sorry, the, the uh, the eastern border is Route 1. Census Tract 4156 is known as Fort Hunt. So West Grove is the northern border. River Farm is in there. Collingwood is the southern border. Fort Hunt being the western border. I'm going to show you some pretty shocking statistics. Um, we've got, and we call, we call Route 1 the wall. Um, and it's a wall because there is a a wall of opportunity or opportunity is walled off from those who live on the west side of Fort Hunt. So what you see here in Hybla, life expectancy is six years less than Fort Hunt. The poverty rate is two times that of all of Fairfax. Folks are making uh, one third of the median income uh, here in Hybla versus Fort Hunt, where there is not a single person living in poverty. Uh, 19% of all residents and um, of in, in Fort Hunt um, pardon me I, I'm sorry I, I misspoke uh, a quarter of the households in Fort Hunt in Hybla excuse me are female led and they're single parent um, they are four percent um, married couples as opposed to 95% in Fort Hunt. Conversely, and I'm just pulling out some of the, the data and I'm happy to share, share this deck with you. And this is you know, dated um, from, you know, uh, this is not absolutely recent data, but at the time there were no blacks and 1% Hispanics. There was tremendous educational attainment compared to high blood and very little crime. There was one arrest of a resident versus 15 in Hybla. Um, robbery, burglary, larceny, it's a fraction of that in Fort Hunt compared to Hybla. So those are some of the statistics and I'm gonna continue on for a second here with when we did our own research working with, um, with an external um, social sciences policy institute we learned that only 17% of three-year-olds in, in Hybla were enrolled in an accredited preschool. And generally that number is about 5%. These folks are living in a food swamp. It's a, an area where there's abundance of fast food, junk food outlets, convenience stores, liquor stores. They outnumber the healthy food outlet options. There is Massive issues with housing. Eviction rates here, as you can see, are two times, two to three times that of the county average. We know, I think most of us here on the call know that wealth building happens, begins with home ownership. And so wealth building is not happening in these census tracts. And probably the most shocking 
um, statistic that usually grabs people's attention is the lifespan in generally is 11 years less than the most well-to-do census tracts in Fairfax, those being McLean and Reston. So if you're a baby born today, your life is expected to be 11 years shorter than a baby born in McLean or Reston. Pretty shocking. I am not looking at um, the, the, the chat uh, because I'm presenting and I didn't want to have that busyness. So if anybody wants to speak up, please do. Um, moving on, we talked to residents a lot during this phase one research. And there were five categories of concern that they raised. They're concerned about the well being of their kids. They feel unsafe and under threat for various reasons that include gang recruitment, theft, drug use, and just distribution of drugs. There is lack of health, safety, and social supports. There is a dearth of decent jobs, um, livable wages, and transportation makes it really tough to get to and from work. And there's a lack of access to information about county resources, nonprofit provider resources, and other resources. I think all of us know that us county agencies, uh, faith organizations, uh, nonprofits, schools, we work tirelessly in Fairfax to make safety, learning, earning, dignity possible for residents. And yet with all of this investment, we have these families living in these neighborhoods and they feel unsafe and experience persistent inequity and multi-generational poverty. And so we're asking the questions, why? Well, we know it's in, this, in these neighborhoods, historic and pervasive racism have really been built into the structures. There's practices and policies and even laws that disadvantage residents of color and low income people. So inequity is built into the system. And until system change happens, inequities are, will persist. And so that's what Communities of Opportunity is really about. It's looking at the root causes of inequity and tackling those root causes and doing so in a way that involves the community and all sectors of the economy, if you will, in, in our community so that we can look at those inequities, take them on and work towards ending multi-generational poverty through structural change. Moving forward here, so how are we going to do that? It sounds very ambitious, and boy, is it. In, in this work that we did with the county and folks that are here, I, I, I saw at the top of the, when we all saw each other's faces, um, facets, um, neighborhood health, certainly county folks, um, and others, we learned that a structured collaborative approach with stakeholders that puts the community at the center is critical to address these systemic and structural issues that are at play. Community at the center is key and it's been the missing ingredient. And for too long, we know that initiatives to address community have been driven from top down without asking the neighborhood for, for their input. And so a new kind of approach for creating systemic change has been on the rise and it's called collective impact. And this framework, which you see before you, and I'm gonna talk you through it, calls upon different actors or different members of the ecosystem. I just said uh, the economy a minute ago. So government, businesses, nonprofits, philanthropy, um, higher ed, um, education in general, to collaborate in structured ways towards shared goals. And, and shared desired outcomes. So our Communities of Opportunity initiative is going to bring to the table and elevate the voice of the community and many of them are clients and members of the community. We also are gonna to bring to the table those who are empowered to make decisions, be they the government leaders, school leaders, faith community, all, all those folks in the ecosystem. And we're gonna to work to identify the needs with the community and not for the community. And so now let me take you through this model. <clears throat> Collective impact is used for large scale community-wide change. 
where racial and social equity is typically at the core. Um, and I'm going to start with number one, common agenda. A common agenda is really what I call the North Star across all, st all stakeholders. We need all those folks that all those groups of people that I talked about to be 100% in alignment in developing a common understanding of the problem and then creating a shared goal or goals for what it is that we are going to achieve. What is our North Star? Then knowing what our North Star is going to number two, developing the data points that we need to measure along the way. So we know that we are on the way to that North Star. Um, and we share the data, and if we find out that we're off course, then we course correct, et cetera. But this is shared measurements. We all have different ways of collecting data, and, and there's gonna be a way to share data through this collective that, that is different than how we currently work with all of us having our own data systems and all um, being uh, kind of working in silos. Um, we know the siloed approach doesn't work. Um, number three, mutually reinforced activities. Th this kind of speaks to that we all come to the table with different uh, expertise, experiences, uh, things that we do, things that we specialize in. So we're gonna come to the table with that and coordinate who does what based on uh, who's best at what. Number four, critically, a consistent and open communications that is focused on um, trust, that maintaining that trust. If we don't have communications that are constant, we're not going to be able to trust uh, the process. And number five um, is uh, very important because this collective impact communities of opportunity initiative, believe it or not, is not going to be inside United Community. United Community is setting itself up to be the backbone support with dedicated staff, and you're, you're gonna meet Yolanda Earl Thompson here in a minute. That is the, we're the convener that coordinates those, in, those participants and organizations in the ecosystem. So it's you know, kind of hurting the cats, if you will, but making sure that all of these things are done. You know, right now we're calling it as a placeholder community of opportunity, um, that's the name, but we expect there's going to be some dynamic name to this. There are collective impact efforts going on uh, around the nation um, regionally that are massively successful. We don't have time to go into those today, but they embrace this model. This model works when it's implemented. Gonna keep going here. Um, sorry, I didn't realize this slide built. Um, okay, um, so community engagement um, is as I said, to very much um, the driver of, a driver of why this is different. Um, and I actually spelled engagement wrong. I apologize for that. Um, but we are going to first be doing quite a bit of, of training, um, getting folks comfortable with what, what, what this is. Because as I said, we're going to be doing things quite differently. So training capacity building. Training has begun and will continue. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Organizing, a critical component. One thing, as I mentioned, with community at the center, you heard me earlier mention the five areas that, that the community were concerned with here. In each of these big circles are those five areas. Then you can see that there are two chairs for each of these, let's call it a committee. So the health committee is going to have a chair that is of the community. The other chair has got to have some expertise in health. The child and well-being committee will have a chair that is of the community, as well as somebody who is knowledgeable around child wellness issues. You get where I'm going. We're going to build leadership into this structure. There's also a steering committee over here, and I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but again, built up with community voice. Because if we keep on doing what we've done before, which is not integrating community voice, we'll have the same result, which is no change. This is, this is going to lead to change. Um, Allison, I'm doing a time check. 
Okay. And, um, so, and I know we want to hear from Yolanda also. So I yeah. Just... And so thank you, Bill. But you are now introducing Yolanda for me. So I'm okay. pleased to announce uh, Yolanda Earl Thompson, who is going to tell you where we are um, in the initiative right now. Hello. So um, I, I, I'm going to uh, lead with that I am a daughter of a Baptist preacher. So trust when I say that, while I love data and I love all that Pallas and Allison just shared, this is really about humanity and connecting to the human spirit and really saying that we, we, we've heard this data before. If we haven't heard this data before, it's not as surprising. It's surprising that it's still happening, but it's not surprising because all of us work in this space. We're all advocates. We know that something is going on and we know whatever this something is, it's such so massive and un, un, intangible that we can't figure out how to get a grasp of it. And I think a lot of it is because we just haven't tapped into the one thing and that is the human spirit. And that's what this is really, this is where we're moving. We need human beings to, to really be, feel empowered, but also to feel connected to each other in a way that says, it, this is it, this the buck stops here. We will stop, just like the pandemic stopped us in our tracks, these inequities must stop us in our tracks and say, we have to address this now. People are dying because of our lack of ability to figure this out. So no matter what is going on, we will continue to provide basic needs. We will continue to advocate. But we also need to stop and say, no longer are we going to allow our neighbors um, to continue to live in poverty generations and generations. Um, I am this community. I live in um, so Sequoia. Um, and so this is me. Um, and so there's a passion that I bring, but it's also a passion that I want to infect others with. Um, and bring my neighbors with me along this journey. Next slide. So that's where this, th this is the ecosystem we're talking about. We need, we're going to use an executive committee that will help with the governance and the recommend and, and helping uh, hear the recommendations from the working groups. So we're, we're doing it quite differently. No longer is there gonna be like top, like Allison said, top heavy, big brains coming together. No, we're gonna hear from residents and advocates like you and, and others that are in this space and working together. Um, and it's gonna be a little uncomfortable. We're gonna be in spaces where you're gonna have the, the non-professional Yolandas of, 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 of when I was just a resident that's gonna say, no, nah, this is some BS. This is, and we're gonna have to be comfortable in these spaces because that's what we haven't done in order to get to, to the change that this community deserves. Not only needs, but deserves. Um, and so we have, we'll have some lead partners um, and some, some will be internal, some may be external um, and because we can't do this. We have a, 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 a guru in the collective impact world that is consulting with us um, named Junius Williams. And he's like, are you all really tackling all five of these? Most collective impact initiatives don't tackle but one. But we say, how can we not? The community said these are important. So we have to. So we need partners um, to not only be in the working groups, but we need partners that are in these spaces already that have these same common agendas to come together, share the, the, um, the, the, the information, but also help in guiding the, the, the solution. My dad raised me, you don't bring the problem and don't bring the solution. But, well, I'm, I'm, we brought the problem. So I got, we gotta be a part of the solution um, and we need others to help us um, in that. So next slide. Um, um, we, are currently in our phase three of this. So we've gone through what um, Allison shared was phase one and two. So we know what we, we, we did the research, we engaged the community, we prioritized, 
we've focused on a couple of quick wins, um, which we'll share a little later what one of those quick wins we're still moving in a, a wonderful direction. Um, um, and, and we're, we're formulating um, some of the foundational uh, components of this ecosystem um, and hiring consultants on myself as the director of collective impact and helping build the momentum of the day-to-day -day operations. But now it's time to work. Now it's time to strengthen this initiative by having resident, uh, residential voices. Um, and we're working with our internal op opportunity neighborhood to get neighborhood ambassadors participating right now. We have mobile distributions in which we're engaging the community because what we found is the trust in this community is broken. They do not trust people anymore. You could be an advocate all day. You can be an ally. You could be a partner. When the community doesn't trust because they're sick of us showing up with donuts and coffee and getting information, and then two months later, they're still dealing with these inequities ravaging through their communities. So they're sick of us showing up with our clipboards and pins and free, you know, free uh, stress balls or whatever. And they're like, dude, I need a job. I need better transportation to get to jobs. I need open space for my kids to play and stop playing with me. And that's what we're saying, time out for the game. And, 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 but what we are realizing is in order to build that trust back, we're having to take care of basic needs. People aren't talking to us now because they see us as someone who's showing up in, in the food lines and saying, hey, here's some food, but by the way, do you wanna stop this for, for your future generations? Unfortunately, we can't stop it for you today, but we wanna make sure the future that we stop seeing generations in the same food lines or in the same uh, programs that we're running every day. I mean, like some of us, I mean, we personally as United Community, people are walking up saying, thank you. I remember being in this line as a child. That's not, that's, that don't make me feel, feel good. That doesn't make us happy. It's, yes, we're happy that we're providing the food line, but we're not happy that generation, two generations later, you still know to come to this food line. We didn't do anything to stop that. And that's what this is. We're going to build and then sustain that change and not just it uh, works for a moment, um, but it needs to work for a lifetime. Um, and so that's where we are. We're going to and we need a stakeholder group to come together with those residents so that the residents feel that there are real people who care about real change. Um, and that's, that's where we are in this phase. Next slide. And that's why we're here. And that's the call to action. Um, we, we, you, can, you can engage in this process in many ways as an organization, as an individual person, as a member of an organization. Um, and, and, and when we call you to the table, here's some things that you can expect. You can expect to be trained how to take action, but then also how to then put it into action, right? So one of the things we, we did a training last year on root cause analysis um, of the racial inequities and in the root cause analysis. Immediately, we didn't go right into an action. No one was able to, but this year, we're gonna put into action how to do root cause analysis. We're teaming up with the county. Um, and when we start these working groups, you're going to go through exercises on root cause analysis. We're gonna train you on allyship because immediately you're gonna to have to go into action on how do we overcome white supremacy that, that continues to plague this, this, this issue. At the root cause of this is a structured system built to create exactly what we keep trying to undo. But if we don't undo the structure, we can't undo the inequity. And so we're going to train people how to be uncomfortable with having to challenge white supremacy, but then get comfortable with engaging each other and in a healing but 
proactive and action driven manner. Um, so you, you can't do this work and not be an ally. And I'm not talking about more of a, uh, as, as I continue to ravage this thought in my head, a co-conspirator ally, <laughs> um, but, but not a private conspirator, but a positive, proactive, transparent, right? We got enough secret people doing stuff behind closed doors. We want to be public with this, this cause and call it out and say no more. And we're going we're gonna to look different. We're going to be different. And then at the end, we're going to do it in a collective, um, impactful way. And so we'll train you, train people specifically on collective impact. So these three training routes will not only guide the process, but empower those that are in the process. We need residents to not come in, see white faces and allow the white supremacy system to inform them not to talk. They need to come in and be able to be proud of who they are empowered to say, I don't want this for my children, just like my parents didn't want it from me, for me, and we are going to do this, but I need the privilege. We, can, we can't do it because we don't have the privilege. So we need the privilege to, to, to come together with the marginalized and create opportunities. And that, that's, my, that's my word and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> So I'll open up the floor for questions, responses. Oh, Yolanda, I, that was really powerful. <laughs> I actually have a first question, if I may throw it out. Anybody else who has questions, you know, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and, and hopefully Joe can, can uh, follow if that. You, Joe, okay. help me out if you can, um, but go ahead, Bill, please. Oh, I'm sorry, you have more? <laughs> no, no, that's it. That's not okay. the end of the presentation. Oh. Um, there oh. is this call to action. So here's, here's my question, and it's really, I think, is partly answered by Yolanda's powerful preaching at the end. Pray it, sister. Uh, here it is. The, the, the facts show the environmental and the spatial impact that result in lower life expectancy, food deserts, lack of health care, lack of transportation some elements in the community, we know which they are, and political leaders, I put leaders in quotation marks, think these facts indicate that the flaw is in those who live there. Yes. How do we change that notion? I'll give you an example. And I intervened when this was said. I heard, uh, white woman raised in Virginia, probably in her 50s, say, you only get what you pay for. And when welfare pays, uh, pays uh, women who are on public assistance to have more children, that's what you get. And I said, whoa, 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 wait a minute here. I don't know a single person in that situation who's happy to have more children. When you have removed access to reproductive health care and made it impossible for them to get to it, and you have created a whole system in which that person is, um, is unable to have a job, can't get to where she needs to go, and besides, there ain't a lot of money being paid for every one of those children for, for survival. So I, how do you change that? Just kept by keep intervening? <laughs> I, th I think that th that is the first step. The mm -hmm. One of the first steps is to get more people to not feel comfortable watching things come across Twitter and not say anything. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we have mobs showing up because we allow people to continue to quietly say stuff and masses then go to back wounds and say, that is one ignorant woman. No, we need masses to call stuff out immediately so that it gets uncomfortable for them. We are allowing people who know what's right to feel uncomfortable sharing that. And that is what this 
Communities of Opportunity hopes to do is to get more people, the more people join these working groups, the, the more we, hit, we have people. Uh, I was talking to an African-American yesterday who was told to apply for a position that she's more than qualified for. And she said, but I didn't, I didn't apply. I said, because you don't have enough allies to empower you against a system that makes you feel insignificant. You need a, you need a village of women mainly black women that will come around you and say, look, I too feel every day I wake up that someone's gonna think I'm a fraud, but you need someone to answer you and say, that is the structure speaking, not your spirit. And, so you, and, and so what we need to do is awaken the spirit within this, this community to say, that's the structure, it's not who you are. So that's the second, step is to not only ask people who are in the areas of privilege to step up, but those that are in the areas of marginalized to feel empowered in the same space of those that have privilege. But we need both. We need both because when, I, when a white man tells me, I promise you, there, and, and hopefully uh, Ron doesn't get offended, but when Ron just sent me a private chat when I got on saying, I love to see your face, that makes me feel empowered as a black person that a white man is excited that I am here. I, I'm, I am excited you're here. I'll tell and, you too. And, and the more I get that, the more passion I get, the more driven I get, and the more I will stand up to white supremacy and say, stop ripping havoc in my community. And when I do it, then I empower my neighbor to do it. And then I power another neighbor. And I'll tell you, I had a story to go along with yours, Bill. A Hispanic woman told me a white man came to her and said, I am not afraid of you because you don't have the right to vote. She said, you don't have to be afraid of me. Be afraid of the eight children in my, in my household that will have <laughs> the opportunity to vote. That will change the, that's your answer right there, Bill. How do we get politicians to start realizing that this community matters is when you start empowering black and Hispanic and BIPOC communities to stand up and say, don't worry about me, be worried about my community yep. because I can't do it alone. Yep. And you but I got a band of people. In my, you ain't closing that voting precinct in my neighborhood. I get to go here. I don't have to go 10 miles away. Yeah, Georgia found out this week. <laughs> Bill, uh, so we, Bill, we, have a, we have a comment. From, uh, go ahead. A question from Bill, from uh, Ron Fitzsimmons. Ron, oh. you want to go ahead? Oh, sure. Um, I'm a former board member of UC, it was UCM. Um, and I just want to make an observation or two uh, quickly, um, I appreciate Yolanda's passion. I always have. Uh, and I'm just kind of, and I know this is a train leaving the station. I get it. I'm just kind of curious. I mean, I think folks know I've been committed to, you know, all these causes for many years, but I always, and maybe too practical. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I zoned out in the first few minutes, no offense, but I zoned out in the first few minutes of the presentation. Uh, I really had no idea what was going on. I mean, I, we all know there's a problem down here, many different problems. We all know that, this confirms it. Um, and I guess I just, I still have this, you know, thing in my heart for UC. And I'm wondering, I guess concerned that is UC going to be pulled away from its basic programs? Because we, we know people need food. They need, you know, eviction assistance. They need this and this. And um, uh, I hope that's not the case. Um, but I also don't know what the end result here is that I'm, I'm happy to raise my hand and join a steering committee or whatever. And it sounds like the same stuff to me. 
it sounds like this, you know, the stuff we've been talking about uh, for many, many, many years. Uh, and I just grow weary of, of the endless meetings and stuff. And so I'm happy to participate if, if I'm wanted. But I, I'd like to know what the end goal is. Like, Yolanda, when you say, I wrote it down, we're going to overcome white supremacy. Whoa, I mean, I'm with you. <laughs> um, how, do you how does little UC get to that point? See what I'm, I'm saying? A, I'm going to definitely let Allison, as the president and CEO, answer that. But if I, if, if I can, um, Allison, one, one, one thing I want, as um, some of y'all may know, I'm a boomerang. United Community is not UCM. It is a different organization. And I'll say that because I left and came back and I see the change. So I can tell you, Ron, that in the past, we really didn't go to our clients and ask for their feedback. And during this pandemic, we learned that we had to. So we had to change how we function. And we allowed that change to happen because we as a organization has changed to say, we can't just do it the same way just because it's always been that way. Because meeting people in the food line, saying, that, saying those things to us really hit us as human. And as United Community, we're turning in to our human spirit as an organization. We're doing meditation at, at the beginning of our town hall meeting so that we can really connect. There's a whole, there's a change, Ron, that has happened at United Community. And, and the, the, the statement of how do we overcome white supremacy? Well, that's why on March 26th and 25th and 26th, show up for the training because it first does start with the individual. But I need more than just me and other Black people. Marginalized people can't do it. Privileged people are the ones that have to do the work, but we help inform. And that's the difference. The difference is we're going to use different language and we're going to call it out. And I, I'm, I, as a Black person leading this effort, is going to be comfortable saying, I need white privilege to work for me. So in our 50th, we're 52 years old now, at our 50th year, that's really when a lot of this was coalescing that we said, you know, we, it's, we've, it's been 50 years of handouts and hand ups. And we're not going to change the trajectory of a person's life by doing that. We've got to additively, so Ron, to, answer, to speak to your question of like, what is you see, and we don't go by UC guys, we go by United Community, because you see could be anything, but we are a United Community. We are not United, we are not UC. Uh, and we know that we need to attend to people's basic needs, but structural change needs to happen. And not little UC, but united community, a united community, it was a purposeful, thoughtful change in our name, bringing together a community to take on the structural changes that needed to be made that's something that we are committed to lead. And as I said, this isn't going to be what you see does, United Community does. It's going to be a, 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 a massive effort that we are coordinating across the community. So our work continues in other spaces, but you know, we're here today to talk about this. And as we shared, and, and maybe, uh, Maybe we got a little too technical. There is an approach here called collective impact. We've got the, you know, the, the guru in the, in the US who's our strategist and coach on this, who's taking us through how do we build this up? It's different in different communities, um, but there's plenty of research and I can show you the studies of how collective and why collective impact works. And so we're gonna set that common agenda together. It's not United Community as an organization's job to do that. It's this collective community of opportunities job to set that common agenda. It would be going back to the same way of doing things of an institution, United Community, telling the community what it needs if we set the common agenda. That's not what's taking place here. So this is really flipping the script, doing things totally differently and 
and and adjacent to United Community and the work that we do day in and day out, adding adding at this additive massive engagement that is that is in collaboration with the county. I see my um, my my friend Carla Bruce on the phone, um, our chief equity officer. Carla, I'm not sure if you were on when um, when I, we mentioned your name or early on, but um, this. This our community of opportunity initiative, you know, fits very, you know, was born out of one Fairfax and us saying we got to actualize one Fairfax here in region one and the conversations with Carla and with funders began then and this fits with what the county is doing. I will say this one of the key players in this moving forward is government a uh, bill to your point elected officials are they going to get it. You know, Carla, you may want to take a minute just to speak to um, how you're going to have how part of your work is having the county show up in these communities, um, prepared to work with us and not be um, separate from and and barriers to change. Thanks, Allison, and good to see everybody. I've been um, in the background. I, I've um, you know. What I'm really excited about is it's not me talking about this, it's you all, because one, enough people have heard me talk about it, and I think it starts to get operationalized when it becomes integrated into organizations and it becomes focused where the need is. And I think that what I heard Palace, Allison, and Yolanda speaking about really represents this real operationalizing of a concept that I think people really embraced conceptually, but the first thing they want to know is how do you do it? Um, two questions um, really um, in response to, to, to Ron. Um, there's the, in terms of comparing where we were before and what's different now. Um, and from an outcome perspective, nothing's really different because there's a lot of work to do, but it's not just working. It's how you approach the work, I think, is, is the change. One, working collaboratively and collectively, not just as a set of disparate partners, really working hard in, in everything that we do, but not sort of looking at where our work is intersecting to better understand where gaps are created and barriers are presented. But anyway, there's two questions. Um, that have been posed to me by folks that I've engaged with over the years that really stick with me. Um, one is, are you comfortable with the current social arrangement, right? Um, and if you are, keep doing what you're doing. If you're not, then you have to tackle it at the structural level. That might not be energizing, that might not be appealing and sexy, and you know, it, it might not get you those sort of tangible results overnight, but you're going to keep seeing what you're seeing if you don't stop and acknowledge what, sort of what Yolanda said earlier, this is structural. So our shared commitment to wanting to see better for a particular population or a particular community is great. But if we are, if we're centering our energy on the symptoms and not what lies at the root, then we will continue to see what, uh, what Yolanda uh, described as the same people generationally showing up in line. Which leads me to the second question that was posed to me and which I have posed to my um, colleagues in the county. Are we ending poverty or are we just serving it, right? And there is value in serving it, right? So there, there are people who have needs right now. And as Allison described, that work will continue and needs to continue and so many people are contributing it. But that does not mean that we can't also have our, ball, our eye on the ball of what will be required to end it and involve the very people facing those challenges in those solutions. So those earlier slides were really meant to 
describe some of the structural process that is undergirding what Yolanda is doing in terms of mobilizing those community voices to really say, this is what I see now, and this is what I see differently, and now let's work together. I would also add that as much as it's diff you know, there's different things that United Community has to do, there's definitely different things that the county has to do. I would say there's a lot of different things that everybody on this call has to do both from your programmatic responsibilities as well as your advocacy uh, responsibilities. Because um, I've, you know, I heard you talk about elected officials and sort of you know, what they believe. They, will, they believe what they hear. They work toward what they hear. And so if you know, this type of, this, if this isn't talked about, what, what, what Yolanda and Allison are talking about today, if this isn't talked about, and put on that table, then it won't be discussed. And so, for an organization and you know, like Vic, um, and you know, sort of the role that you play, I think there's a tremendous role in terms of not just organizing the impacted community, but addressing those voices and those in those folks that are because there's still pressures working against this, right? There's still pressures to maintain the status quo, and so. It's not just about serving people. It's about figuring out what's standing in the way of our progress and working on that too. So, you know, I hope, I hope you all can see that again, this is the beginning of a journey to really not just serve poverty, but to overcome it, to end it. It's aspirational, absolutely. But if we don't have that focus, we'll continue to see the same results we're seeing. And I, I'm not, and I don't think you all e either, are satisfied with the current social arrangements, which are really set upon a structure that was designed to work for some people, but not all people. Thank you, Carla. I really appreciate that. And I know that we're getting close to the end. And so I would like to invite you all, if you all feel like this, could, this conversation should continue, I'm open for a brown bag because there is a lot of framing that has to happen, but some evolving. But I'll let you know that my community created hip hop. So let, let's just start right there. Like what's different? Oh, we have it in us to totally change the, the, the way that the world works and moves. And if we could then shift it to say, okay, we're not going to just do it in music and culture, but we're going to do it in politics and we get the right allies and the right stakeholders to, to, to come behind us, this initiative, it stops becoming just an initiative. It moves past the movement and it changes the structure of how we do things. So if you don't believe it, ask Jay-Z what he was doing 20 years ago, selling crack. So if you don't believe that in this community, we can take someone out of Sa uh, Sacramento or, or some, uh, I mean, uh, Sequoia or Creekside and make them a billionaire, I got a couple of people I asked you to call. <laughs> so All they needed was a couple of white folks to say, I believe in that. You want to you wanna, you wanna do your own what? Okay, I'll invest in you. And they become, but I don't want just, I don't want to just become a millionaire. That's the difference. I want my whole community to have generational wealth. So as we send around um, the invitation of uh, the presentation, we will also send around an invitation um, for Yolanda and I were literally chatting in the chat. Why do we have a brown bag? Because clearly we've kind of run out of time here. Sorry, Joe. Sorry, Bill. Oh. Um, but anybody who'd like to join us in continuing this conversation, um, we, we would enjoy that. And so we will, we will uh, work with Christina, Joe, Bill to, to continue the conversation. Fantastic. That's a, that's a great idea, Allison and Yolanda, because mm -hmm. I, I, there's so much here and, and thinking about how Vic can both join this effort, how each of our member organizations can join, um, and, and how we can think about both structural aspects as well as serving basic needs and, and how do we do both and how do we prioritize between those and, and how do we, as, as, as Carla mentioned, how do we advocate to make sure we're um, affecting the, the conversation broadly too? 
Um, we do have a few so, minutes. I see Mary Payton's hand has been up for a bit. So uh, Mary, do you have a question or comment? I do. And I just wanted to tie this a little bit to what Vic is doing next month. Um, I'm one of the people that Yolanda mentioned that has run community meetings and, and used the post-its and the chicken dinners and whatnot to get uh, people to talk about their concerns. And one of the major concerns we heard was that people were afraid of being displaced by development of the Embark uh, project. And I, I'm sure they raised that concern with you as well. That's sort of an existential concern, concern for the community. Uh, not only would they be poor, but they wouldn't be there at all. Um, possibly if there's not a replacement of the lower income housing. So next next week, we're going next month, we're going to have a, a Vic meeting on that topic on displacement. And we're going to look at it from the press perspective of people in Gum Springs community and some of the mobile home parks, uh, which are under threat of being sold and um, developed into something else. And also we're trying to get someone from Chamber of Commerce to talk about um, displacement of small businesses along the Route 1 area as, as the development comes through. And this is an issue that's going on now. It's not waiting for all of us to organize um, node groups and whatnot. I mean, this is coming up right now. It's coming up before the Board of Supervisors, January 26, and coming up in a task force working on preservation of affordable housing in February. Uh, so it's a, it's a very timely thing to be thinking about and working on right now. And we'd, we'd love to work with the United Community as well on that issue. Thanks, Mary. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. No, um, I was going to follow on to what Mary mentioning next month's meeting. And I was just going to highlight the meetings coming up. Uh, so the February 3rd one, which will be at 1130, it will also be by Zoom. And I'm going to try to make sure that all of the future ones are on this particular Zoom link that you've got so that it will be the same one uh, so the, on development and displacement. And then in March, going to be a local pandemic impact that Joe's working with the health department on, hopefully Joe. <laughs> and uh, April is going to be uh, Congressman Beyer. Um, at 1130 a.m. on April 7th. Uh, Christina has been working on that and he's all committed. And then May 5th is going to be a panel. Now that in the agenda that was sent out, there was an earlier tentative title and we didn't like that. The title for it is going to be why we serve and seek justice and equity for those in need. So that's where it is at the moment. We are coming up with some, some plans for that uh, that will, and it's going to be a panel and also we're gonna have um, a handout that's gonna, or a send out that's gonna go out earlier in advance for everybody. And we're gonna have some, some kind of deep, open-ended, difficult questions to kind of get some thoughts from each of the panelists. Uh, so it's not gonna be a presentation that the Christians make a presentation and the Jews make a presentation and the Muslims make, it's gonna be <laughs> big questions for the, uh, that each person on the panel have an opportunity to address. So, so that's, and then the June meeting typically is the brainstorming the topics for the next season. So, um, so that's where we're going forward right now. And um, Joe, did you have anything else to add or show? Well, I, I, I see Ann Hargrove has her hand up now. Oh, sorry. And I, I might have missed you earlier, I apologize. Oh, okay. Anne, are you here? Well, I, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I put this in the chat, but I, I feel very strongly that, you know, there has, there's got to be a meeting of the minds um, between uh, West uh, Route 1 residents and East of Route 1 residents. I, I think many people who live East of Route 1 would be responsive to this study and this effort um, if they could be educated. And I, I think that that will involve, you know, going into those communities, going to those churches, becoming friends with people, talking to them and raising their awareness. I, I think that is a really essential part of this effort. 
and um, I, I, I would definitely be willing to help um, help this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Might be a good presentation for the Mount Vernon Council of Citizens Associations too. I totally agree. During the Black Lives Matter protest this uh, summer, I, I served on a couple podcasts and things like that, and they at, and a lot of white people came to me and said, "What can I do? How do I?" I said, uh, "Invite some black folks to your porch and just hang out with you. You, it be friendship takes things so much further than me just trying to learn it through some training. It's about relationship, which is why this." This, this, this initiative has working groups so that people can come together and create relationships around an issue. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just a man that it's about relationship. Um, me and Allison, that's part of the, the foundation of our relationship is me one day saying, Allison, it's about relationship. Let's get to know each other better. <laughs> Um, and, and, and here we are, uh, uh, Ebony and Ivory really growing uh, personally. And then that is transforming the community because we're, we're learning from each other. I mean, it's just, uh, some of this stuff is just obvious, but it has to be called out to what it is in order for people to really understand how to do it. It's like Carla said, it's not anything new. It's, it's the approach is new how we're doing this so if you if so if you get those um that slide deck out to christina to send and also make sure that you highlight in the email the allyship training and when it is and how we sign up for it so that people yeah. don't say oh this has come with an attachment i don't have time to look you know make sure that that yes that for the, now just save the date march 25th 26th it'll be from 10 to 1 it'll be a morning three hours each each day. So for now, it'll be a save the date and we're working with the yep. um, organization to get registration and all of that. Okay, thank you. I think we'll look, we'll look for that brown bag invitation as part of that as well, right? That'll be- Absolutely, a nice absolutely. Game. Fantastic, thank you. Well, thank you everybody. I think we've come to the end of today and it was really, um, I, I thought it was really meaty and there's a lot to learn from this. And I think when we have time to study the slides, you know, it, even more so, because I think some of us are going to come back with questions. So we'll see you all on February 3rd. And uh, some of you in between who are on the steering committee and uh, the rest of you um, stay strong. Remember that he is with you every day. All right. We'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Have a blessed day.